this week we're continuing we're continuing talking about uh, the precariat and whether it's a class or not. Kyle, how do you feel about taking this first slide? I don't think we did this one last week, so let's just give it a quick go over in case we didn't. Fair enough. Okay. The precariat's place in class analysis. If we accept the idea that objectively definable material interests are a legitimate criteria for differentiating class locations, the next question becomes how to specify these interests with respect to the class structure of contemporary capitalism. This will help us answer the question of whether the precariat and the working class are distinct classes. For this task, it will be useful to use the game metaphor introduced in the discussion of Gr of the Grisky Whedon model of microclasses. The objective material interests of any location in a capitalist system can be specified at the level of the game itself, at the level of the rules of the game, and as moves in the game. The level of the game itself. The Marxist question is this. How would the material interests of people differently located within capitalism be affected by a change of the game from capitalism to socialism? Some reject the idea of socialism as a viable alternative to capitalism or argue that it is possible almost everyone would be worse off and so there is no class differentiation within capitalism at the level of the game. This means that all class locations have shared material interests against socialism. Uh, probably those uh, national conservative types you were talking about, Tom. Uh, given the obvious complexity of modern class structures, how can we clearly specify the interests of people located within the existing economic structure with respect to an alternative as abstract as socialism? Solving this problem has been the central preoccupation of Wright's work on class. Wright has proposed the concept of, quote, contradictory locations within class relations as a way of connecting the complexity of class structures within capitalism to the alternative of socialism. The basic idea is to identify a series of locations within the class relations of capitalism that were in some sense simultaneously dominated and dominating or exploiting and exploited. In the present context, this implies that with respect to material interests defined in terms of the games of capitalism versus socialism, such locations have contradictory interests, interests pointing in opposite directions. Yeah, like one thing I think that like they kind of leave out in this analysis of, of just contradictory interests or, you know, these um, uh, contradictory locations within class relations is just kind of like the idea of risk. Like, you know, there's an, a huge risk associated with trying to go to a new mode of production, as in you might get yourself killed or your house could get burnt down or you could have to go fight in a war or, you know, any one of many very negative things that could happen to people. And, you know, this is a major obstacle to a revolutionary mo movement. It nearly it seems to me why, you know, revolutionary movements are actually attached to war so much is that, like, all the bad shit has nearly happened to some extent. And people just say, well, let's have something else. What do people think? It does seem to be quite missing from the book, as far as I can see. Yeah, I mean, I guess it doesn't quite fit into this uh, question of um, dominated, dominating, or exploited, uh, exploiting and exploited, um, because you can simply lose out in absolute terms outside of the relationship, I guess. Yeah, I suppose it's close to that second point there about like all class, oh, sorry, uh, that it's possible almost everybody would be worse off, you know? Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, but I, I think that uh, it's subtly different, right? Because the point there is that everyone would be worse off under socialism, and not that everyone would be worse off as a result of the transition to socialism, right? Right, right. yeah. Yeah, which is, this is, of course, discussed in later chapters. And we'll get into what Wright thinks about socialism versus the transition to socialism and the, what the game theory of that is. 
But I think it's fair to say that he's, you know, trying to position the contradictory class location jargon as a reason why that, like, people can have sort of conflicting interests, but, like, overall have a, just overall have, like, a location and, like, it within, like, a complex economy. And, yeah, it doesn't shake out into the binary very easily all the time. It's, like, not that helpful. And it's also, like, look, I used to be a Maoist. Um Okay. Like, but it's, it is, it is a necessary like concept. If you're going to have some kind of like two binaries of class relation, some sort, like you have to be like, yeah, reality is also really complex and shit. So I'm not really sure. I think, I think right is like starting to answer the people that don't think the people that think it's possible. Everyone would be worse off in socialism. Like this is the beginning of his answer. Yeah. Fair enough. Does anybody want to hear the the car registration number plate I saw today? I I managed to take a photo of it, but it was kind of obscured. There was a bird shit on the windscreen when I was driving. But, I'm, not, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. There was a car in front of me. There, there was a car in front of me today that had the number plate X eighty eight Mao. Um, <laughs> so that's like oh, yeah. X Heil Hitler Mao. Like I I don't know if it's random. Like wow. Who's, coming up with that crazy that, that doesn't sound random no it well doesn't. uh we we can we can note that uh i think it was as of today uh the last opposition party in hong kong was uh finally uh disbanded the the progressive bourgeoisie the 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 liberal bourgeoisie party gave up uh in the face of uh police brutality or I don't know, probably not brutality against them so much as just the impossibility of doing anything. Standing against the proletarian dictatorship? Uh, yeah, I mean, that would be one way to describe it, I guess. It's clearly the most scientifically correct way, comrade. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, the glorious socialist future will be delivered by police brutality. That's right. Yeah. Yep, same as it ever was. Um, you know, I'm starting to understand why Mao and HH are on the same plate. Oh, I'm sorry, 8-8. Um, 8-8, oh. yes. X-8-8 oh, space M-A-O, M-A-0. That was what M-A-0? it was. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next slide. Uh, I'll take this one then. Uh, the, the level of the rules of the game. The problem of class interests concerns which set of rules governing capitalism are optimal for different locations within capitalism, given capitalism is the game. Are the American, Dutch, Danish, or Chinese rules superior for manual industrial workers? What about the highly educated workers like doctors or engineers? Do different rules of the capitalist game confer particular advantages or disadvantages on people in different locations within the system? These questions can be asked for the large-scale variations in the rules of, in the rules of capitalism. For example, neoliberal slash social democracy welfare state and for second order variations in the rules. The point is, we can define material. What does it mean there, the second order variation in the rules? It's just smaller. Okay, yeah. The point is, we can define material interests and thus the nature of the locations of people in a class structure with respect to such variations in the rules of capitalism and not simply over the game of capitalism itself. Okay, so we've, we've kind of hit this stuff before, haven't we? There's no point really going any further into it, is there? Okay. And Ezri, how do you feel about doing then the this one, the level of moves in the game? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Uh, just a moment. <laughs> did you just did you materialize from? Yeah. From from a away team, away team transporter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That wasn't like a like an alert or something. That was definitely what it sounded like. The precarious place in class analysis, the level of moves in the game. The problem of class interests concern the optimal strategies people face in securing and improving their material interests, given that the rules themselves cannot be changed. The problem each person faces in their own specific position is this. In terms of my material interests, what should I do, given that I am in my current position? Should I try to move into a different kind of position, become a different kind of player? Should I get more training to improve my bargaining position in my current location? Should I join with other people like me in collective action, 
for mutual improvement? And if so, who are the people, who are the other people like me for this task? Using this metaphor of capitalism as a game, we can turn to the question of whether the precariat is a distinct class from the working class. Just how different are the material interests of people in the precariat and in the working class with respect to the games itself, sorry, with respect to the game itself, the rules of the game and moves within the existing game. At the level of the game itself, the precariat and the working class clearly occupy the same position, sorry, the same location within the class structure. The material conditions of people in both locations would be enhanced in a socialist economy. However, since the collective struggle for such an alternative is not presently on the political horizon, class divisions at the level of the rules of the game and moves in the game may be more immediately relevant to the question, is the precariat a class? In terms of rules of the game, it is certainly clear that under the existing rules, neoliberal capitalism, the material conditions of life of most people in all three segments of the precariat are worse than most people in the working class. But does this mean that the changes in the rules of the game that would significantly improve conditions for the precariat would adversely affect the material conditions of the working class? And are there changes in the rules that would benefit the working class, but would worsen, worsen conditions for the precariat? Are they on the same side of the fence or on opposite sides? Standing proposes the precariat charter, which includes 29 articles, demands for improving the conditions of the precariat. These are all solid progressive proposals that would make a tremendous difference in the lives of people in the precariat. But these proposals do not go against the material interests of the working class, and nearly all of them would significantly advance the interests of workers. This is not true for everyone in capitalism. Standing's plutocratic elite would certainly lose out if these reforms were enacted. The same would be true for much of the salariat, especially for the well-paid segments of the corporate hierarchy, they would also interfere with some of the advantages of the proficients. If we use the 19 articles of the precariat charter as a diagnostic test of class locations with respect to rules of the game, the precariat and the working class are parts of the same class. Do you want to have a, let's, let, let's read out, I'll read out a few of these uh, precariat charter sure. article, article one, redefine work as productive and reproductive activity. Not sure what that means. Reform labor um, statistics. I do. I mean, I know what it means. So, well, like, uh, you know, reproductive activity is, is stuff that. Oh, uh, yes. Sorry. Sorry. Like, sorry. Yes. Is usually left out of the circuits of, you know, you know, productive value, but is actually essential for, you know, producing value in the economy. Different economists have different ways of constructing what production actually is. But, yeah. Yeah, sorry, no, I was thinking of like reproduction and just like reproducing the economy in the general sense, but not in like, you know, paying women for childcare, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, reform labor statistics, make recruitment practices brief encounters, bizarre, regulate flexible labor, promote associational freedom, reconstruct occupational communities, that's article 6 through 10, articles 11 through 15 are stop class-based migration policy, uh, stuff like this. Stop demonizing the disabled. Stop workfare now. Decommodify education. Make a bonfire of subsidies. Move towards a basic income, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the common the deliberative right. democracies. Remarginalize charities, which I thought was the yeah. Fuck a charity. Yeah. I mean, I'm not even joking. They need to be remarginalized, according to our. our <laughs> what, what is Pretty remarginalized good. charities? <laughs> I guess, like, stop relying on nonprofits to fill the gaps left by the state. Yeah, like, it's been sort of like a, like, Tory social engineering hobby horse to fill social service niches with charities um, wherever they can. So I think it's just like, yeah, maybe we don't need those, actually. <laughs> Specifically, like, faith-based charities. Catholics have a belief in... Like some more politically minded Catholics, like we'll have debates around like whether justice can uh, be accomplished through charity or through you know some kind of socialism or social democracy. I think what you're thinking of, Kyle, is the big society. No, 
I am, yes, I am thinking of the big society. It was like a David Cameron thing, right? Super large. The big society entailed cutting people's benefits and letting the disabled die. That's essentially huge. What, that's a yep. huge society. It, what, very what big. Wait, didn't David Cameron fuck a pig? He it's fucked called, a pig. Uh, yeah, he, he did, did also fuck a pig. Yeah. Well, that's a terrible thing to call his wife. You know, in well, <laughs> hey, hey. Wait, is that is that is that pig uh the big society? The pig society? The pig society. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes it was. Um so, <laughs> Does David so, Cameron get horny watching the wall? Uh, All right, I don't know. Do you got it? Have you seen that, that episode of uh, Black, whatever it's called? What's that? No, that's a... no, no, but we all know about that episode of Black Mirror because there was that tweet about that episode of Black Mirror. I, and, and someone watching it in, you know, the good old days <laughs> was just like, huh, it would be wild if David Cameron fucked a pig, wouldn't it? Like, oh, yeah. And then <laughs> all of a sudden it started blowing up. And there's like, there's like a new tweet response. Why is everyone retweeting this? Has David Cameron fucked the pig? <laughs> uh, it's very funny. You should watch it. It's actually it's actually really good. That episode. I don't a lot of the Black <laughs> Mirror ones I didn't like too much, but that one was goddamn hilarious. Nothing like a bit of bestiality to make me laugh. Now, so b- going on the previous slide, so basically they're making the case You're essentially. <laughs> Essentially, is that like the precariat and the uh, working class have the same essential class interests, so they are essentially a part of the same class. That's what that previous slide is saying. Is that correct? Am I? Yeah. Am I? Well, this yeah. Is, this is a better argument than I remember it being. Is mm-hmm. that? Yeah, that's all right. So let's go to the back of his book about the precariat being a separate class and look at all the things that are good for the precariat. All right. Well, let's say we do all this stuff. Does the proletariat have antagonistic interests or basically the same? Well, would all if we did all this stuff in the back of the precariat charter, in the back of the book about this new class, does it hurt them? Does it hurt the greater proletariat or does it help them? Or not even the greater proletariat, but the quote working class, quote, as defined in the book. <coughs> and no, no, it pretty much helped them. So they kind of have aligned interests, I guess. Let me just put on my pretty, pretty my, good argument. And my, no, I think that's a pretty good argument. Let me just put on my dumb bimbo hat and also my devil's advocate hat. Two hats. Two hats. Is it not, the, not the same hat? No? They are, but I, we don't no. want to talk about that. No, no way. Like, there, there's a certain type of person that doesn't need to play devil's advocate. That is a bimbo. That's true. And they're much better than the devil's advocate. Yes. The devil's advocate hat is worse than the bimbo hat. But I'm putting on both. What, what, would, the devil, what would the devil's bimbos, the devil's bimbo hat look like? Oh, that's you have to pay extra for that. I don't know if we can. Okay. That, that only fans is that only that, fans. That's only fans. Yeah. Shit. So, why does it matter if the precariat and the working class have aligned interests or not? Couldn't the precariat just be a separate class that has similar interests to the working class? So, so couldn't the precariat have similar interests and be something different? Yes. But I think that wouldn't, that would, well, that would mean that they're like the, the way he's defining class as in their interests, material interests align, is that they're in the same class. You know, if there are no differences, is that not what he's saying? Like if the precariat know. and if the precariat and the, and the working class as they define it had exactly the same material interests in all these different directions, they're essentially just two components of the same class. Well, he he does also you know you could out. say left-handed you could say left-handed workers and right-handed workers right and define yeah. them as classes but you would then say well they align in all these different things so essentially they're the same thing they're all the same part of the same class right it's a needless division <coughs> no but there's a much right. more powerful there's much more powerful i mean first of all uh, no there's nothing about having interests that go the same direction that make you exactly the same class but also in the book there's you know a bunch of stuff that helps the nominal working class, which doesn't help the precariat and locks them out of employment. And that's the whole reason the book exists. I see. So fair point. Fair point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So perhaps there is a case to be made that either it's like a subclass or maybe it is a different class, is what based on what you just said, Esri. There's totally a case to be made. You know, you could say it's like a labor aristocracy thing. Okay. And yeah. that having a union is uh it's actually, you know, like a you know, like a privilege essentially. And uh Or check your privilege union unionized workers. It's not a joke here. No, I know. Some people think but, this way. No, but I'm just saying, like, this is, you know, it's it's a live way of doing things. And I guess maybe this is why I thought this argument was like, eh, okay. Like, but, uh, you know, is, is that it doesn't actually totally address, like, a fundamental relations of production thing as much as it, uh, as it could. I think on some, even on a level of relations of production or something like if you have some sort of like legal guarantee, then you have a you know kind of a bigger political economic advantage, in in some respects. Like I think it's just it's kind of undeniable. That's kind of like I would have preferred you know that kind of differentiation on the level of relations of production and all that kind of shit. Um, because yeah, I'm not sure like this totally defeats the argument. But, you know, it is kind of a fun argument to just go to the back of the book and be like, yeah, um, <laughs> if we did this, you know, it does still help the working class. It, it doesn't cut against them like it would with the salariat or the proficients or the, you know. Elite plutocrats. Yeah, yeah, like a octopus elite or whatever he calls it in the book. <laughs> Sorry. The globalists. It, it, is, it does kind of, yeah. It, it reads no. like that, yeah. yeah. Don't but, talk uh, to the globalists, God damn it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, okay, so maybe to kind of punch up, or maybe not even punch up, but zero in the counter-argument, oh. maybe it's better to say that what Eric, what, what Wright accomplishes in this chapter is not completely taking down Sanding's argument, but rather maybe like cutting it down a little bit saying that, well, there's so much overlap between the interests of precariat and the working class that some like focusing them uh, as like a distinct class may or may not be true, but it's not, they're not, uh, their um, interests are so aligned that they'd be better off working together. Even if the working class as defined in Standing's book does have some advantages over the precariat. Because this book, what's interesting about Standing's book is that there is this kind of phenomena of workers who have like a union or just like have like a good stable income and employment versus people, a lot of people who just don't have that, who go from job to job, who are very precarious. I personally don't think that constitutes a separate class, but there is something to that difference L living on both sides of that, you know, myself. Oh yeah. Well, it's a huge difference. It's just like, yeah, I think we went over last time how much this concept of the, this way of carving things up is overtly, overly historical, like overly invested in our sort of like a historical understanding of what the working class was and how people in the precariat now aren't the working class because you know, the working class is when you have like a union and there's like a big world war and you have to stop the Nazis. It's not actually like no. capitalism is so much older than that. The historical working class is more like, more like the, the precariat where it's all atomized and kind of fucked and doesn't have its own institutions most of the time. Right. It, it just is. It's so much more like that most of the time. And I, I guess what Eric Olin, right achieves here is, is, the old Marxist maneuver of, you know, sorry, snowflake, there are two genders, you know, proletariat and bourgeoisie. Like, um, it, with class analysis, this is, so true though. this is the, this is the Marxist go-to move. And, and Wright is basically saying like, if, when it comes down to it, you know, what's okay, maybe what's good for the working class, you know, narrowly constructed in this labor aristocratic kind of sense, is is not good for the precariat, but what's good for the precariat is good for the working class, yeah. narrowly constructed. And because of that, 
they're kind of they're basically on the same side of the fence. It's right. very it's very literally like a binary reductionist argument. They're on the same side of the fence. Right. Right. Like. Right. Well, perhaps to sharpen to sharpen our, our, our analysis a little bit, there may be more than two classes, more than two, the two genders, perhaps. But yeah, there are well, poles around which their interests are more or less aligned. Right. And yeah. They're better off working together on each side of those poles, near those poles or on each side of those fences. What, what yeah, because like, 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 hang on, Tom. Because, really, uh, like, right does not does not say that the interests of the salariat and the interests of the <laughs> sorry, what was the other one? The proficients do coincide with the with the precariat and the quote unquote working class in that that neatly binary way, right? Uh, he does he doesn't make that argument. He doesn't no. say that, that, that those are actually identical as well. Right. No, 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 not at all. Like, and if anything, if anything in this discussion of the precariat charter, they would sort of be on the opposite they, side. They would they have enough like labor aristocratic uh, elements to actually be on the other side, which is kind of a stark set of claims. What like, class is uh, what class is slime mold in? That's uh, the key slime question. Mold. Slime mold is in a contradictory class location. Next question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's in six. It's in six hundred classes. Okay, the. Uh, well, Sophia, let's let's read this slide because I think this kind of sums up some of the stuff we've just been talking about. All right, the precariat's, uh, the precariat's place in class analysis. The diagnosis becomes somewhat more complicated when we ask if there are other significant changes in the rules of the game that would advance the interests of most people in the working class, but would be harmful for the precariat. For example, would changes to employment law that would increase job protections for workers by making it harder for workers to be laid off have the side effect of harming the precariat? Would legal changes in the U.S. that would make unionization easier by rejecting the anti-union strategies of employers harm the precariat? There are some ambiguities here. These types of rule changes could have the effect of deepening the dualism in the labor market and making it harder for those in the precariat to move into more stable jobs. It is also possible, depending on the details of such changes, that they could increase the number of previous that they could increase the number of precarious jobs relative to stable jobs. These ambiguities are a basis for considering the precariat to be a distinct segment of the working class at the level of the rules of the game. Different segments of a class share the same general interests over the optimal rules of the game within capitalism but differ in the relative priority of potential changes in the existing rules it may have opposing interests over specific rules in certain historical contexts. Another possibility is to argue that these tensions between the precariat segment of the working class and some of the rest of the working class reflect a specific kind of contradictory location within class relations in 21st century capitalism. The idea here would be that those workers who still actually have enforceable rights to their jobs, the most secure, if dwindling, part of the working class, have a kind of limited property right that normally is associated with owning the means of production. The right to fire an employee. They can quit, but they cannot be fired. In this way of framing the problem, much of the precariat is firmly in the working class while the most securely protected workers occupy a privileged contradictory class location. It kind of okay. solves that. Yeah. I right. Mean, so he's, sure. he's defining the, he's defining them like, uh, like a, as a segment due to like the fact that they only differ in the specific rules of the game, uh, with respect to their material. Uh, they 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 differ in how they would prioritize moves in the game, right? They have they have they have different rankings of preferences relative to each other, uh, he, even though overall 
they 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 share the same class interest. But he also says may have opposing interests over specific rules in certain historical contexts as well, Kyle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Enough with this neoclassical preference, fucking ordinal preferences. I have to read enough of this shit for the calculation. <laughs> the <debate>. calculation <laughs> he does try. He does try to bring it in there. It was in there. It does. It is. It's, it's part of how he thinks. Definitely. I mean, you know, this also makes sense of what's being said. I don't know if there's really an argument against splitting this off into its own class. You know, like here is another way of making sense of it. This is a little, you know, if you want to, if your intuition is that is to have fewer classes than rather than more, why don't you just fold these two in? Yeah, well, well, I think the thing is, like, if you look at this, like you were saying, from the, like, relations of production perspective, it would be quite hard to make the argument that they are different classes. But again, yeah, that's not right. the approach he takes in this chapter. Right. Right. I just kind of really dislike the idea of calling, like, this privileged sector of the working class their working class. I just kind of despise that way of muddying the general relations in society you know yeah but you, you can't you can't talk about this book's ideas without trying to represent that somehow yeah. right but you know you could call it like the you know unionized working class or you know the privileged sector or something that's not just their working class because in reality like if you look at back the time when marx is writing capital and all that kind of stuff like the vast majority would have been in the precarious Right, they right. Yeah, they weren't well, unionized or anything. Whatever the precariat is in you know the nineteenth century, because it's supposed to be this highly historicized category, and yeah, I don't know if I agree with the precariat framing per se, but I think we need to talk about this distinction between more secure workers and less secure, and the more secure workers in reality is the more historicized segment of the working class that wasn't around before that came around and now the unique situation we're in now is that that is being dwindled away that's the unique thing not the precariat they've been around since forever yeah yep kyle do you want to take this final slide all right so so what about class locations defined with respect to moves in the game Perhaps the precariat and the working class could be considered distinct classes. If thought of as microclasses, as proposed by Gruski and Whedon, when class is specific, or sorry, when class is specified exclusively in terms of the optimal moves to realize material interests under the existing rules of the game. Two problems arise with this proposal. The first, the working class itself ceases to be, quote, a class if we restrict the specification of class to moves in the game. The interests of workers located in different sectors and occupations can easily diverge sufficiently to create lines of demarcation so long as interests are defined with respect to moves in the game rather than rules of the game. Number two, the precariat itself is internally divided into distinct categories at this level of analysis, as Standing himself acknowledges. What we are left with then is that the precariat is either a part of the working class, if class is analyzed in terms of the basic rules of the game in 21st century capitalism, or it is itself an aggregation of several distinct class locations, if class is defined narrowly in terms of homogeneous interests defined by moves in the game. The precariat as a rapidly growing segment of the working class and the bearer of the sharpest grievances against capitalism may have a particularly important role to play in struggles over the rules of capitalism and over capitalism itself, but it is not a class in its own right. If class analysis is to help us develop a coherent, consistent way of theoretically understanding social cleavages and the possibilities of transformation, 
The concepts we use should have precise meanings that illuminate the nature of shared and conflicting interests and potential collective capacities. For these purposes, treating the precariat as a class obscures more than it clarifies. So what do people think about that? Do you think this is the correct way to go about defining a class? I mean, this isn't exactly how microclasses was used before. It'd be more like bundles of microclasses, right? Like, because microclasses are sort of at the professional level. But like, yeah, isn't well, this just like a, a, a very specific, level. this is like a very specific definition of microclasses uh, so. um, that is like, peculiar to Grusky and Whedon. Okay. Yeah, right. The, uh, yeah, optimal moves to realize interest in the existing rules of the game. That's right. Yeah, so, like, that seems quite dodgy because, like, you would... Like, there's that issue, as he says, that, like, you kind of get to, like, uh, of sort of, like, bad infinity of class division. Right. <laughs> or you could like Zeno's paradox your classes down to infinitely small <laughs> class uh, identities. Yeah. Um, but also it seems like it would be, yeah, really like problematic over time because like your, your, your classes would probably be like more chaotically composed than would be recognizable to the people in the classes, right? Like it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be, they'd be class, class definitions that would only be of interest to economists, I think, as opposed to like, even like sociologists or just people trying to make sense of what are the distribute, what's the power distribution in the society. Like it, it, it feels like it would be something done purely out of a kind of like obsession with like this methodology, uh, more so than like something useful. Yeah, I guess, I guess he's trying to just not dismiss it out of hand. <laughs> Does seem like a stretch. Yeah. So, like, the previous definition that we had in the previous slide differed from this because it was about what? Uh, like, sort of, like, the idea that there are class interests over time as opposed to, like, purely, optim uh, like, an optimization problem of, like, what is the best next move? Yeah, is 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 that kind of the difference? Because yeah. it sounds like Wright is saying that this is a different this this is a different definition than the one we saw in the last slide. Yeah, I think it is, and I think it's about oh. this is about this is more of an observation problem. Whereas before, like, let's talk about class interests as far as like changing the game or changing the rules of the game. Well, this is also about the moves in the game, rules of the game distinction. Were we also in the game metaphor last time? We were, yeah. Yeah, we were, but it was about the rules, and this is purely about the moves. Yeah, this is purely about the moves. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. I get it. I get it now. Yeah, Where it's like you, 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 don't, you don't take changing the rules to be a move in the game. It's, it's just yeah. these are the rules. They exist. Uh, within that that uh, constraint, what is your optimal solution? Okay, yeah, got it. Cat categorization based on moves rather than rules. Yeah. Okay. Are we happy with the we've done we've 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 uh, shoveled the precariat into its proper place? Anything outstanding for us to discuss about the precariat? I found this one of the least interesting chapters in the entire book. I must say. What were people's <laughs> generals? Some like theoretically interesting <clears throat> questions that this is related to. You know, the specific the specific question of the precariat is maybe like not nominally like interesting, but like it is like generally kind of an interesting thought. Like, you know, given that given the political role that workers' movements had in, in the twentieth century, um isn't there like a sort of broader layer of the proletariat whose interests that went underrepresented? 
in the 20th century labor movement? I think it's a fascinating, really important question about what Marx probably was hoping the proletariat would mean uh, rather than what it turned out to mean. Um, so it's like re really like right next to and related to a very important question. It just, you know, not, maybe not the most penetrating analysis I've seen of it. Yeah, the problem with this chapter isn't so much the problem that the precariat theory is trying to solve, but rather focusing on the precariat theory itself. It's just of its time, and it's not something you see people talk about much anymore. I, I don't see, at least. Because there have been mm -hmm. unionization movements in the precariat. Yes. No, it's true. It's, and so, like, what... that that That's kind of like the working class a little bit. Right, and so like, <laughs> what? Where are they? Are the Starbucks workers who like just from the work a union? Like, are they now working class? Well, like, I mean, I guess this, you know, what was would Starbucks workers have always been working class in this framework? Because they have like, is that stable enjoyment? Or something? I don't know. Employment? I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why not? Let's ask. <laughs> let's ask X A D H M A M A O M A zero. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that guy no thinks that everyone in this country is, and in all the countries we are in, are all all Starbucks baristas are petty bourgeoisie. Yeah, they're all PV. Yeah. They I belong to, to us. Shot. I, I mean, I don't think we we honestly need to have like a long discussion about like whether Starbucks baristas are like have stable employment because like. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's fair. They they definitely don't. Like your yeah, hours as a Starbucks that. barista are completely at the whim of your manager and they do all kinds of bullshit to screw with you over that. So I think they're definitely like in the precariat as it's defined here. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm just putting it forward that like But they'll pay for your school. Like that that's I don't know, that's a discussion online. Like like a really loud bad one listen if you have blue hair and work at a coffee shop you, you get the wall you, that's you, it no you well you can't be uh you can't be a worker right because you're culturally different like you're you're the wrong kind of worker you're the yeah. ruling class essentially you're the ruling class if you got blue hair is that that's that's, that's uh your that's what i've learned from... it's color analysis Right. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's the globalists and the blue hair people they rule the world that's yeah. right yeah is, right. is yeah. that is that how we achieve communism is everybody gets blue hair and then class class domination no longer exists only color domination exists yeah but not skin color hair color would there be domination yeah it's both the same hair color though it would just be there would be no domination to be uni well, yeah, you could. You would always have the option. You would always have the option to like re retain your natural hair color, which would put you as an oppressed person, right? Yeah, that'd be insane. Listen, the barista at Starbucks refused to have sex with me. She's oppressing me. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded. That sounded too real, Sophie. That sounded like a true life story. I mean, that probably is a psychosexual root of a bunch of this like weird barista punching online even though they're like one of the only sectors that's like hey we used to not have a union and now we do no and, and then you have all these quote workerists that are like no no this doesn't count Listen. like why doesn't that count that what like what wh no why isn't like a workerist happy that there's unionization like it, there must be there must be some deranged psychosexual root i think you're right about that Listen. I'm not going to vouch for whatever you're about to say. Please <laughs> <laughs> look on your face. I'll vouch for it. <laughs> Sophie, Listen, I'll vouch for it. I'll vouch for it. <laughs> thank you. What I'm about to say is this. Workers are people who align themselves with races. Okay, yeah. To kill all the women at the, at the Starbucks who refuse to have sex with me and get my name wrong in my cup. Okay, and thanks for coming. We'll see you next week. <laughs> I told you. I told you. That, that was, was putrid. <laughs> <laughs>